Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to our audience in the United States and internationally. What a show we have for you tonight. Here in Washington, a budget battle is looming and a raging gun control debate is underway to opine on those issues as well as the end of U.S. adoptions in Russia. We'll be joined by radio talk show host and Fox News contributor Laura Ingram. And later, the president's gun control proposals have sparked a conversation about violent content in movies, TV, and video games. Is there a connection? between what young people see on the screen and what they do in life. And just how much violent content is in your cineplex right now? Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center's Culture and Media Institute joins us to share a new study. And finally, we'll bring you a sneak peek of a brand new documentary on Our Lady of Guadalupe. Producer director Tim Watkins is here to discuss his new film, The Blood and the Rose, and will tell you how you can win a free ticket or a pair of tickets to attend the premiere in Washington, D.C. on January 24th. Remember, you can be part of the program. Get your calls and emails in now. The number, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980. Or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. Let's get started. Here's the brief. News from the world over this week. The protection of children is making political headlines around the world. Starting here in Washington, President Obama on Wednesday issued a series of executive measures and called on Congress to enact the most comprehensive gun control effort in nearly 20 years. The president repeatedly invoked the memory of school children killed last month in Newtown, Connecticut, saying, our first task as a society is keeping our children safe, and that we must do what we can now. Among the congressional proposals, an assault weapons ban, a ban on high-capacity ammunition magazines, restrictions on bullets, and a universal background check. The president's executive actions include directing the Centers for Disease Control to research the causes of gun violence and a, quote, national dialogue on mental health. The legislative measures appear to lack the support needed for passage. Speaker John Boehner said the House will wait to see what the Senate passes. And the Democratic-controlled Senate is stopping short of pledging any immediate action. More about this later in the show. And on Sunday, a reported one million or more demonstrators from across France took to the streets of Paris to protest the government's plan to legalize gay marriage and adoption. It is believed to be one of the largest French protests in the last 30 years and the largest protest against gay rights in the world. The march centered on protecting the traditional family and the rights of children to have a mother and father. The proposed gay marriage law would trigger both adoption rights as well as government assistance for same-sex couples to conceive. President Francois Hollande and the Socialist Party majority said they were unmoved by the protest. The gay marriage measure is scheduled to be introduced to Parliament later this month. Also on Sunday, tens of thousands took to the streets of Moscow, protesting its government's recent decision to ban Americans from adopting Russian children. Shouting, shame on the scum, protesters carried posters of President Vladimir Putin and members of Russia's parliament, who overwhelmingly voted for the law last month. Opponents say the adoption ban victimizes children to make a political point. The law is seen as a retaliation for a new U.S. measure targeting Russians accused of human rights abuses. It also addresses long-brewing resentment over the 60,000 Russian children who've been adopted by Americans in the past two decades. Well publicized in Russia were the deaths of 18 of those children. UNICEF estimates there are about 740,000 children not in parental custody in Russia. The adoption ban takes effect in 2014. We'll discuss this in our next segment. And Egypt's new Islamic constitution is be beginning to show its effects. 
This past week, an entire family was sentenced to 15 years in prison after converting to Christianity back in 2004. The mother, Nadia Muhammad Ali, was raised a Christian. She converted to Islam when she married, then converted back after being widowed. She convinced her seven children to do the same. All took Christian names at the time, and they obtained a new ID card with a change in their identified religion. That was illegal, according to the court. Seven government clerks who assisted in the ID change were also sent to prison, each receiving five years. In spite of the rulings, Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi on Wednesday assured a U.S. delegation, a congressional delegation led by Senator John McCain, that religious liberties would be protected. McCain told reporters afterward that the delegation would seek nearly a half billion dollars in additional economic aid for Egypt and its new government. That would push the total U.S. aid package for Egypt to over two billion dollars annually. A Catholic church and several homes in Belfast were badly damaged by firebombs on Monday as Protestant loyalists escalated six weeks of violent protests. Tensions and sectarian clashes have been rising since Catholics on the city council voted to end the display of the British flag. This was a show of solidarity toward Irish nationalists seeking to end British rule in Northern Ireland. Protests and flag marches by the Protestant loyalists have turned into riots. Over the weekend, more than 30 Belfast police were injured in confrontations with rioters. More than 100 police officers have been injured since the start of the protests on December 3rd. And a mixed bag of religious freedom decisions were handed down this week by the European Court of Human Rights. The court ruled that British Airways violated the European Convention of Human Rights in telling an employee that she could not wear a cross necklace while at work. The court said the employee's cross was discreet and cannot have detracted from her professional appearance, as was argued by the airline. The court also noted that British Airways had previously authorized employees to wear religious clothing, such as turbans and hijabs. The Strasbourg-based court, however, ruled against two other British nationals, a marriage counselor who was fired after objecting on religious grounds to giving sex therapy advice to gay couples, and a government registrar who refused to conduct ceremonies for same-sex civil unions. In those cases, the court said the employer was pursuing a policy of non-discrimination against service users and the right not to be discriminated against on grounds of sexual orientation was also protected under the Human Rights Convention. When we return, we'll discuss the president's gun control proposals, a new pro-life poll, and the end of U.S. adoptions in Russia with a mother of two adopted Russian boys. Talk show host and author Laura Ingram is up next. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. She's the most listened to woman in political talk and the author of several New York Times bestsellers, including The Cultural Romp of the I Zing, our little collaboration, to discuss the political reality of President Obama's gun control proposals and much more. Would you welcome back to the program her first appearance of the year, Laura Ingram. Hello. Good to see nice you. Nice to see you. Okay. It's Let's... freezing in the studio. Well, we have to, we, I it's have to winter, Ingram. Need a collection what did you want? to get heat in here? Well, what we'll, is... we'll, we'll, we'll actually take up cold. a collection oh, if you allow goodness. it. Oh, my goodness. Okay. My mink. All right. Zsa -zsa. That, that's in the next segment, Saja. <laughs> Let's talk about the president unveiled these gun proposals yep. this week. Um, background checks. What is your problem with the universal background check? Well, Even the NRA says this yeah, is well, not a bad look, thing. Look, I think the NRA has said, and uh, rightly so, that they have been open to doing background checks uh, properly and well and more efficiently. That can be done. They don't get any credit for that. They even said that you can, at gun shows, why not have an ATF booth for private sales? So private to private, you want to do an instant check? That can be done. ATF can set up a very inexpensive station for those people to do that. Basically overlooked. Those 
offers to work with the gun control folks. So, look, the universal background checks, as has been proven time and again in every study, while it sounds like a great idea, mm -hmm. I don't really have any problem with it personally, but it sounds like a great idea, in practice, it does pretty much nothing to stem gun violence. It's not like criminals are going, well, before I go on my rampage, can I run myself through an instance? No, no, they, they, they either steal guns, as we're seeing happening right. a lot in this country now, mm -hmm. uh, or they get them on the street and they buy them illegally. So it's a, it's a black market for guns. That's going to exist regardless of whether there's a background check. The president put forward the notion— And I don't think it's constitutionally uh, required, probably, either. I mean, the gov I, don't, I don't like the idea of the government— having lists of Americans, a list. I'm not sure why we need lists of law-abiding Americans. I don't think they have the federal authority to do that. Let's talk for a moment about that, since you bring it up. Yeah. You mentioned recently that you're concerned that the doctors here, and people haven't paid much attention to this, the, the, the president has sort of expanded his health care uh, uh, notions here by including doctors and turning them into really inquisitors of the government. Right. Expand on many, that for many, us. Many uh, interrogators because part of what the president said in his directive yesterday, and he pa they passed out these, these sheets of paper, part of it was we're going to make sure that nothing stands in the way of doctors ask and, and, and health care professionals asking questions of patients about whether they have a firearm in the home, whether they have young children, and whether, and whether there's any mental illness history or, or current mm -hmm. problem. Now, very interesting when you think about that, but going back to your gun registry issue, yeah. the gun registry is not going to pass. There's not going to be a, a, a mm -hmm. universal gun registry, I don't believe, not in Congress. But if you can get enough doctors to make this part of their routine questioning of patients, you might just be able to get a decent-sized list of Americans who are law-abiding people, who have guns in their homes, maybe what types of guns are there, maybe oh, did they ever have antidepressant uh, pills that they've taken in the past, does that mean they shouldn't have guns? Again, I just find well, doctors are so overwhelmed right now, and you know I have great respect for them. The idea that they should be doing any more than saying, perhaps, you know, look, you should know about gun safety. You have small kids in the in the house. You, you know, I hope you have a good gun safety plan. That's something different, and that that mm -hmm. I wouldn't have any problem with that. But the idea of reporting back electronic medical records, if that's in your oh. record, Raymond, that stays with you forever. That thing but follows you everywhere Lord, Something's you go. got to be done about the explosion of people with mental illness who take up these guns. I mean, to follow on your argument, if it's not law-abiding citizens and it's people who are right. mentally, uh, you know, having mental difficulties, what can the government do, if anything, to control their access to these weapons? Right, well, cross-referencing with actual mental health uh, convictions, uh, people who've been uh, committed, uh, making sure that if they're, uh, for instance, at a university, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Aurora shooter, right. before the, not the, Aurora, the Arizona shooter, uh, before he went after Gabby Giffords and that crowd, he had been at a, a college in California, yeah. and people had big concerns about him. They were afraid mm -hmm. to really do much about it politically correct concerns, they don't want to offend anyone. Mm -hmm. That has to stop. But the government keeping lists of, of law-abiding people done nothing wrong and exercise their Second Amendment rights, I don't like that. I don't think that is, mm -hmm. that is really something the executive branch should be Let's involved Let's talk in. about the assault weapons ban the president is proposing. I mean, uh, classifying what an assault weapon is, I suppose, is a problem. But does that stem the violence? Does that stop these well, random acts of uh, Centers of, for of Disease tragedy. Control study on, on all of the major gun control uh, uh, points and pieces of legislation demonstrated that they have almost no effect on gun violence. We have 500 million guns in the United States, about that many. Three, th th excuse me, I think 300 million guns in the United States. Uh, the president President's proposals would cost $500 million to implement. Uh, we have people, uh, millions of people who are gun owners. The idea that, you know, that's going to have much of an effect, it really isn't. I mean, uh, we, can, we can look at these weapons and say, oh, they look scary. But they're really, they're semi-automatic weapons. Uh, fully automatic weapons are banned by federal law. Mm -hmm. Ban. This is one trigger pull for one bullet. What do you say to those? Even even the bishops have said there's too much access to guns. And how much firepower do you really need, Laura, to defend uh, yourself? I don't know. That's my decision, not yours or the federal government's, and nor the bishops. So I mean, I, I, I would imagine at the at the bishops' conference they have security. I, I, they should. I hope they do. And r regular people should be able to decide for them 
what is the best way to both defend themselves, use guns recreationally, and frankly, it's none of the government's business, as long as you're not doing harm to other people, what you want to collect, what you want to have in your possession, fully automatic, that's a different deal, because that's truly, you, you spray mm -hmm. a crowd of people, um, that's truly a military-style uh, weapon, but this is not an M16, where it's a one trigger pull and you have multiple uh, bullets being fi fired at one time. It's a big misperception about, misconception about what an assault weapon is. And again, that's a, it's a fig leaf. That, most of the crimes are not committed in this country with AR-15 rifles. There's an infinitesimal percentage of, of gun crimes committed with those. Mostly it's nine millimeters, mm -hmm. uh, pistols, uh, sometimes other rifles. But the, the AR-15, that's just, that's a Now, you were very ploy. upset about the political backdrop, the theatrics the of the announcement yes. the president made, because there were children in the yes. background. I put this question up on Twitter and Facebook, and you all should react. I want to hear from you. Your thoughts. Why is this so upsetting, considering, Laura, we had 20 lives lost at Sandy Hook. Don't they represent, as some people have already said on my Twitter account, don't they represent those 20 souls that, that, that were part of this violence Here's and victims of it? Here's the way I'll put my concern with this. Number one, uh, if the president were to similarly respond to children and their parents who've written letters asking the president to reconsider and go to Congress to not not even ban all abortions, but make them more difficult to uh, to carry out because so many lives have been lost. I mean, there are a lot of children who will show up at this March for Life next week who have that view. Young people, parents. I have a feeling if the White House is inundated with those letters, those children aren't going to be brought in. There's not going to be a backdrop. There's not going to be an emotional reading of their letters. Look, the president can have any kind of event he wants, but at the same time, he can't admonish everyone else out there not to bring children into political context, which he did at the beginning of this campaign, Raymond. He said children are off limits in politics. That is his line. Not my line. That's his line. He set the bar, and routinely, he dips back into the well of referencing both his own children and in bringing children into the White House for political cover. To make, to, in other words, you, you question President Obama on guns. Somehow you don't care about those poor kids up there, their views, uh, their parents, the parents who are suffering as a result of Newtown. I find that highly offensive. Okay. I want to talk about religious liberty. This week, on Wednesday, President Obama observed Religious Freedom Day. He issued a proclamation celebrating this cherished first freedom. In it, the president stated, foremost among the rights Americans hold sacred is the freedom to worship as we choose. Today, we celebrate one of our nation's first laws to protect that right." End quote. Here's the president from Wednesday's gun control announcement, where he sounded similar themes. Listen. This is the land of the free, and it always will be. As Americans, we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights that no man or government can take away from us. Along with our freedom to live our lives as we will comes an obligation to allow others to do the same. We don't live in isolation. We are responsible for each other. You know, the right to worship freely and safely, that right was denied to Sikhs in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Laura, in light of what we heard there and these HHS mandate battles playing out in sure, the in federal the courts, courts yeah. your thoughts on what well, you heard? Well, it's, it's nice for the president to say uh, people actually have a right to worship, but there's also there's a free exercise uh, a, a, a element, a core element of the First Amendment. The freedom to exercise your religion, not just to worship behind closed doors, but exercise your, your religious beliefs. And the free exercise of, of our faith requires that we live our faith. And I think that has been completely trampled by this administration. And we'll see what all that happens in all these federal court cases challenging the HHS rulings. But it's quite draconian the way it's playing out. But boy, he can make it sound really good, can he? Let's talk for a moment about something I know near and dear to your heart. In Russia, uh, spearheaded by President Putin, the uh, Congress there, the legislature, mm -hmm. decided to outlaw. U.S. adoptions of Russian children. You are a mother of two yes. Russian boys. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on this and, and the impact it's having on the lives of these children? Uh, both heartbreaking and infuriating, Raymond. And I know a lot of people watching might think, well, there are kids in the United States who need to be taken care of. And absolutely right, there are. But these are all God's children. And for the hundreds of children who have already been visited by American would-be parents in the United States for the first time, the government, by the way, invites you to come visit a child. The first First time you go, I went seven times in the last three, almost three years, to Russia as part of this process. To say to those parents, forget beyond that, but say to those parents, they cannot proceed 
is a violation of the human rights of those children in those orphanages and institutions today. There are 12-year-old children who are asking orphanages today in Russia, when is my mom and dad going to come pick me up? And I know this from firsthand, from people who are working through this process now. We as a country must say to these Duma members, the, the Russian mm -hmm. legislature, and to Putin himself, you are in violation of these children's human rights, universal human rights. We have a bilateral agreement with Russia on this. Mm -hmm. You cannot travel to this country under that Majinsky law that they were so mad about. You cannot travel here. You cannot own property here. You cannot whoop it up in Florida as they were doing on December 28th. A lot of these legislature, uh, legislators were down in Florida having a grand old time with their kids. Uh. They should not be allowed to come here in this country as long as those kids' lives hang in the balance. If they don't want to let us adopt in the future, that's their business, and I think it's a horrible crime. But as far as these parents, Raymond, who are already in the process, all of them, they should be allowed to proceed with their adoptions. And the State Department better get that message straight to the Russians. You think this was a retributive act against that uh, the United it, States? It, it uh, is part of that. that yeah, it's part of that. And, and also, Putin really needs this nationalistic uh, spirit to rise up in Russia. There's an mm -hmm. enormous amount of discontent in Russia about the way he's uh, strong arming the process, subverting what was supposed to be a democratic process. Mm -hmm. There were uh, almost Almost 100,000 Russians showed up in Moscow and marched against this ban over the weekend. It got very little play in the United States. That is a profound statement against Putin and what he's trying to do to these kids, who will languish. And many mm -hmm. of them will be put out on the street, Raymond, if they're not adopted by both uh, but, but, Europeans but Lord, and Americans. Given the United States' uh, leverage right now, which is zilch, yeah, not much. Uh, how, how much impact can they really have on well, this? They, they like to come here. They, they actually behind. You mean the Russians like yeah, to come yeah, here? Yeah, the, the Russians love coming to the United States. They live the high life when they're here. They're very elite, uh, elitist, these Duma members. And I think it will hit hard if they are not allowed to keep their property and spend all their money and have their kids go to college here. Remember, their kids are at American universities right now. As these children are suffering and languishing without caretakers, without parents, and many of them, sadly, without the love. That's all they want is to be loved. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I, literally, I've been losing sleep about this since this thing happened, and I'm not going to stop till something's done on this. Before we go, the March for Life is coming yep, up this I'm week. I'm going to go. I'll be there. Um, your thoughts on where this pro-life cause stands. There was this new Pew poll, and their interpretation, which I, I'm going to explain in a second why I think it's flawed, 63 percent said Roe v. Wade should not be overturned, 29 percent said it should. In fact, those those numbers have not changed very much no. over well, the last 20 years haven't or so. changed very much, but still, I mean, I, I look at that march. I look at the the young people on college campuses and pro-life, the pro-life movement uh, bubbles up from, from the grassroots. And I, and I believe, it, I still believe there is a turning point. I think you do not deny uh, our basic humanity, and you do not deny what technology reveals in, in, in supreme clarity today, Raymond, uh, inside the womb. And so while we're talking about saving children from terrible violence, that is a laudable goal. We should all be for that and do it the right way. Right. We should save children from what's being done to them at their most vulnerable point as well. And I'm telling you, the president, I think he came forward and did something on abortion. Same time we wanted to do something on something on gun control. Maybe people would uh, look at his motives on gun control a little bit uh, more charitably. Mm. If you look deeply, there was a Gallup poll done in, in May. Yeah. And when you ask the questions just a little differently, a majority actually, though they're not for overturning Roe v. Wade, they are for limiting more abortion. Restrictions. Which this new poll just didn't, they didn't well, ask the question about And there's no indication whatsoever that President Obama or his cabinet or Kathleen Sebelius has any interest in limiting abortions. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, uh, Planned Parenthood has more abortions the last, last cycle than they had the year before. I'm almost out of time. Yeah. You're back on the radio I now. Am. Many people will be delighted to know. Yep, back on. Uh, new show, a little, little more culture, uh, mm -hmm. still hard-hitting politics, but also, you know, Raymond, you and I have talked about this before, but we have to be in the culture to affect mm -hmm. the culture. So uh, we have an eye on the culture, and your contributions uh, are always uh, great, and, you know, we have a lot of EWT and, uh, fans in our listening audience, so it's a great, great cross-pollination of viewers and listeners, so it's Laura fun. Laura Ingram, thank great you Great to see you, Raymond. Warm friend. it up in here. My hands for, are all ice, right. We'll, we'll get you a mink next yes, time. Thank you. Uh, full mink. Uh, for more information on all things Ingram, visit Laura's website, lauraingram.com. Of the I Zing, America's cultural decline from muffin tops to body shots is still available at bookstores everywhere and online. Tim Watkins is coming up next on his new film on Our Lady of Guadalupe. And in the aftermath of the shooting tragedies in the U.S., attention has turned again to the role of violence in movies, video games, and TV. What are the effects and how much violence are on your movie screens right now? Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center will share his new study with us when the world over live continues. Stay right there. Now, one
once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. According to the American Society of Pediatrics, st their statistics, children watch between two and three hours of TV each day. Their study also found that by the age of 18, children will have watched and witnessed 200,000 acts of violence on TV alone. What effect do these images have on the young, on all of us? My next guest initiated a new study of movie violence on screens today, right now. What he found may shock you. Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center joins us. Dan, thanks for being here. Good to see you again. Now, tell me, first of all, about this study. Why did you decide to look at just the top Five movies in Cineplexism. Well, what it dawned on me last week after the movies came, came out, how violent the top five movies were last week. And of course, Gangster Squad, which was very controversial when it came out. If you remember, the original trailer for Gangster Squad mm -hmm. showed six uh, you know, LA cops who had left their jobs to go right. fight crime, walking, carrying Tommy guns firing through a movie screen, walking through the movie screen, and slaying a movie audience uh, in their battle against Mickey Cohen. Well, that came out, the trailer came out right as the Aurora movie shooting happened, which also happened in the theater. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, they said, well, we have to pull the trailer, we have to redo the movie. They so they killed the people in Chinatown. Well, the they, so they so what they did, they changed it and just, you know, we knew the movie's coming out, they changed it to another ending that kills about 25 people. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so, we knew that movie was coming out. I looked at the, okay, I'll go look at the schedule and saw what was likely to happen. We watched when, you know, when the, the weekend results came out. And of course, four of the five movies you could arguably say are, you know, action adventure kind of movies. And then one of them was a comedy. I thought, okay, this is a pretty representative take, just like the last week was. The previous week, we knocked out Texas Chainsaw Massacre of 3D and Jack Reacher. Why? It was just, they got pushed down on the list. Oh, they've been. Fell out of the and top then, five. then we, but the end of getting replaced with Zero Dark Thirty and Gangster Squad. Mm -hmm. So, so it's like, you know, violence replacing violence. We thought this that is ghost. all the administration is focusing on. All the major media are focusing on guns, mm -hmm. and they're ignoring the cultural implication of violence. So, what did your study find when you looked at the top five movies? Uh, and I couldn't believe you exempted uh, Texas Chainsaw. And, well, and only because uh, they got knocked out. We could have done mm -hmm. ten, but you. Yeah. Know, you you get the point. With five, okay. five movies, we're trying to turn it around really fast. Okay. And we found, we looked at three things. Violent scenes, and of those violent scenes, how many of those were with guns? Mm -hmm. And then victims. Well, violent scenes, there were 65 violent scenes. And that's, you know, when they start shooting, I mean, some of these movies had a dozen or more violent scenes, and it just lasts for, for several minutes. But and they, how many they, slayings in, the, uh, in these top well, five movies? Uh, the victims, because they're not all slaying some of the victims of rape and other things, 185. And that actually understates the case. Some of the scenes were so dramatically, you know, just killing people, we're just going to blow up people. You, you couldn't tell how many people were victims. So that's really, that's kind of the baseline, which works out. I mean, the quick math of that is, you know, you're talking about more than 35 you know, victims per movie, and one of them's a comedy. Okay. Now, the administration has come out, the president said he, he wants to commission a new study to look into the impact of video violence, uh, broadcast violence, video games, and the causality of actual violence using firearms in, in society at large. What's the problem with that? It's Why a don't waste you support of time. that? Oh, it's, a, it's a waste of time. We, we, for one, we've got years of academic studies pointing to the impacts of desensitization and you know how much kids get bombarded with violence and how you know uh, over, overwhelms them. But here's the other study that, frankly, is the free market study. Mm -hmm. You know. We have these things called businesses in America, and frankly, our own government. They advertise. They advertise every product they want to sell, and they bombard us with it in media. We see it on TV. We see it on, you know, here on radio. We watch it in print, whatever. And we know that if they want to sell something, we see a lot of it. So what Hollywood is doing to us every single day is they're hitting us with billions of dollars of marketing to push two things debauchery in sex and incredibly 
just graphic violence. Is it mm -hmm. any wonder then our society's suffering for the impact of both these things? Yeah. No, I, I, I was sitting and watching one of the bowl games. Uh, you know, and this used to be something, a sacrosanct time that family could sit and watch, a, a, particularly a major championship game. We're watching this with the boys. Here comes Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Here's the Victoria's Secret ads. And these are like, you know, beyond prime time ads in the, in the content, stuff we would never allow the kids to see. And indeed, you have to sit there with the, your hand on the clicker to flip it off the moment it comes on. Yeah, and that's, and it's, intentional we what's funny is Hollywood you get them talking and they will admit that they've influenced the culture to be pro-gay that the, the, the new normal glee modern family and just an endless stream of pro-gay movies that they've they they helped create the last election where gay marriage passed in several states mm -hmm. uh, I live in Maryland so you know one of the states that it was impacted so they'll admit that. But then when you talk about, oh, well, all the sex and the violence, oh, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Oh, we didn't do that. Yeah. It's, it's, they're talking about both sides but of the mouth. What, what is the causality here? What is the causality between well, what we see on the screens, what kids view, and, and what's actually happening and playing out? I mean, you look at the, you look at the studies, and the studies link the two in, mo in most of the results. Mm -hmm. So you know, do we know for, for certain that these killers, you know, Lanza and, and you know, Lofner and others that they were inspired by this we don't know because there's so many you know elements what's the government seems to be looking for is we want to make a quick fix on something that won't really cause anything but it's just they're seizing the opportunity you know taking advantage of the crisis and then they'll study everything else what do you make of the success we're seeing of Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the number one movie in the country Django number one movie in the country uh, these are very violent films. I mean, the, the Quentin Tarantino movies, really, from the very beginning, from his, his first Reservoir film, Dogs. Reservoir Dogs uh, to awful, Pulp Fiction, you know. down the line. It's, it, but it is an ironic violence mm -hmm. that is meant to elicit laughter from the audience. What is the impact of that? People watching that and finding glee and humor in the massive slaughtering of people, whether they be good characters or bad, normally they're bad characters in his films, but. What, what does that do gray. to us? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it desensitizes to and creates sort of a societal gallows humor. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yes, if you look at these top five movies that we, we let's, by and large, there's a lot of violence being done by good people against bad people. Mm -hmm. But the graphic nature of it is, is far worse. I mean, you look at, uh, go, I'm a huge movie buff, and people, will, you know, if they're watching this, I've been to Sundance three times. I'm, I'm a movie fan. Yeah. Uh, but what adults see with an educated view and what we bombard children with is different. The, the impact of watching incredible graphic violence and then just and then laughing about it. I, I think then you see footage from what goes on around the world, news, you got, you, it, it damages your sense of empathy. And you know, mm -hmm. I, I, we as a culture, I, I've always been known for that. And what do we tell parents? What do you advise them to do? Because whether we like it or not, the kids are being bombarded with this stuff. It's coming at them in a myriad of ways in various devices, mm -hmm. and not only the the violence, but hypersexuality and and increasingly a graphic depiction of that. Uh, you know, not 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 always uh, in the certainly in well, the best light. Yeah, I mean, they say a lot of young kids are are learning about sex now through porn, mm -hmm. and I th you know, whether it's apocryphal or really legitimate, these alleged pornography studies can't even find a control group of adult men that have not seen pornography. So yeah, I mean, I saw that's, that study you know, that they're 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 having a problem with this. But the the first thing is you cannot check out if you're a parent, you can't check out of the culture. The culture will find your children, whether they find them as teenagers or find them as adults. So you have to at least acknowledge the culture exists. You can do all the right things. You can put uh, software in your home computer so you track what's going on, mm -hmm. software on their phone, put the computer in a public area, block certain channels. Then they go to school. They watch what they see on computers in school. Mm -hmm. They can see the televisions in school. They can go over to their friend's house. Their friends are all carrying around the, the latest droid or iPhone and or, you know, or, or whatever, and they can play these movies, etc. So you mm -hmm. need to prepare them to be good children of faith, to, to, to follow your beliefs and say, I don't want to see that. That teaches me wrong lessons. Or you look at that and, and not learn the bad things. Look at it and say, that's sad. You know, mm -hmm. that, you know, you're showing you know, 
awful things there. Why are you watching that? You know, you're, mm -hmm. you know, you claim. So you really have to have this ongoing dialogue with your child constantly and, because of the, the 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 increasingly graphic nature of all this material and its impact on them as they evolve and grow. Yeah, and it, and then you have to get over time. You have to not turn, not block. Okay, we're just talking about not not pause and fast forward. You know, so so that so you you build, I, I guess, a force field around them. I mean, I, you know, the, the Bible talks about you know faith being your shield and stuff. You know, that's what you need to you really build that armor for them because society is constantly chipping away at it. You know, I was I was stunned when I pulled this University of Pittsburgh study, and I mean, this is one of many thousands of them, um, and and it says here it's seeing violence go unpunished. And how unhealthy that is as a child is developing the desensitization you mentioned, and then this notion that they begin to believe that the world is a mean and dangerous place, and what that does to a child's sense of self and the society at large. And we haven't even touched on news media. And I mean, there is there Easy is a, now, uh, Danny. Okay, <laughs> there, there, there is an element to that. I mean, look, I spent no, decades I, I in understand. journalism. When you when, when someone runs on the field in a football game or a baseball game, and they did a streak or something like that, the news media. Don't report that because they don't want to create copycats. But when someone goes and shoots 26 people, including 20 young kids, we spread that person across the front pages everywhere in America, everywhere in the globe. And if you're not wrapped too tight, you know, if you've got mental health issues, you look at that and say, I could go out in a blaze of glory and everybody will remember me. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think that's a problem. And then we have chased faith out of society. We've chased, you know, you, you, you find you know, the media and both entertainment and news media attacking, uh, attacking religious faith. You find them attacking family. Mm -hmm. All the things that people used to cling to and hold on to, they undermine. And then they say, oh, we've got to blame guns. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I think the, the other thing that, that, that is often missed, when there is something good, when there is something to be celebrated in the pop culture, whether it's a TV show or a movie like Les Mis or something like it, um, that celebrates the best in us and, and the, 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 a, a redempt, has a redemptive nature, those things really have to be celebrated and, and people have to, to, to support those. Or they are going to die out and you're going to be left with nothing but Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Louisiana Chainsaw Massacre, and Arkansas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. But the, the problem is Hollywood, they always say, well, Hollywood's out for money. That's a complete and utter lie. Because if they were out for money when Chronicles of Narnia, when they finally made the Narnia movie, which was enormously successful, yeah. wild, built-in audience, their response should have been, well, clearly, you know, people of traditional religious values in this country want to see movies like this. So we're going to turn around and make what? The Golden Compass, where, <laughs> where you systematically the characters in that movie try to kill God, and it's a particularly direct attack on the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And they tried to sneak it through this so they could make all three movies, and just, yeah, you know, well. they found that people of faith are not dumb. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I think they, they, they ran up into, you know, they ran into the, the monolith of Bill Donahue. Okay. I think that's I, the end I, of that. But yeah. that's the problem. But that's yeah. the problem. They don't want to make money. They didn't want to make money in the built in audience. They wanted to stick it to mm -hmm. people of faith. Very good. Dan, thanks so much for being here. Here to check out the results of the Media Research Center's study on movie violence in last week's top five films. I posted it on my Twitter and Facebook pages. It'll take you right through to the report. Uh, good reading. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Being good here. to see you. Up next, filmmaker Tim Watkins is here to tell us about a story of hope, the new Guadalupe documentary, The Blood and the Rose, The World of Alive, continues in a moment. Stay right there. <laughs> Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. In December of 1531 in Mexico, the Virgin Mary appeared to Juan Diego, now Saint Juan Diego. The apparition became known all over the world as the Virgin of Guadalupe. The image she left behind transformed the Americas and helped spread Catholicism throughout the continent. My next guest is the director and executive producer of a new documentary that captures the saga of Our Lady of Guadalupe and the history Behind the Miracle, The Blood and the Rose premieres January 24th here in Washington, D.C. To tell us about the film and the event, I'm joined 
by Tim Watkins. Tim, right. welcome how you to doing? the program. Thank you. Let's talk for a moment about how and why you embraced this project. Why our Lady of Guadalupe? Well, it was uh, uh, I was on a, a journey of uh, reinvigorating my faith about uh, 10 years ago, and then along came a film that I made in the face of evil on Ronald Reagan, and uh, had some popular support and people who liked it, and uh, all of a sudden. Uh, uh, some people from Mexico wanted to make a documentary film, and they contacted a guy named Steve McAvity, who sure. uh, some people will know produced He's the been Passion. On the program yes, before, absolutely. Yeah. So Steve gave me a call and asked me if I'd be interested, and I was on this faith journey. I said, "Wow, this is awesome! Why wouldn't I choose to do it?" Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we jumped on the project right away. Hmm. Tell me about this. This was part of a long personal journey for you. How did exposure to this story to Juan Diego and your son? Mm -hmm. How did that? Conspire well, well, to take you to where you are now. The first part, my, my youngest is autistic, and uh, Brian, and uh, my wife Susan, and my lovely kids Megan and Timothy, my other children. Uh, but Brian is, is has autism, and, and about ten years ago, I was on a search for why us, why him, why did this happen, and, and I started going to mass every day uh, during Lent ten years ago. And during that time frame, I went to a Special Olympics event, and, and there I saw uh, incredible joy and happiness. Uh, and I, I, maybe because I'd been going to Mass every day, I had an open heart and open mind and, and open eyes. And I, I saw love, joy, uh, they'll never judge, they'll never hate. And, and all of a sudden it came to me, you know, we call them disabled, that's kind of amazing. We're the broken ones. And he's been an inspiration to me ever since. Uh, he's. He's just led me to a life of service and uh, a better understanding. So it, I continued on in the journey, and you know that helped me prepare me to be uh, try to be a Juan Diego. <laughs> and and tell me what you discovered in this journey, because you I mean you made repeated trips to Mexico. This mm -hmm. is a seven year mm -hmm. project for you to make this film. Absolutely. We you know when I first started the film, uh, I, I maybe knew about this much, mm -hmm. um, and I was just excited to get involved in a project that, that was of my faith. And uh, so we went to Mexico and we were doing all our research and we couldn't find a lot about Cortez, so we decided to go to Spain and uh, go to Cortez's hometown, Medellin, Spain. Mm -hmm. And right next to Medellin, Spain is this little town called Guadalupe, and it, it really intrigued us. And so we started to do our research and digging, and lo and behold, there's a whole part of this story that was uncovered because of this happening of, of research in Cortez. And it's, it's one of the, the very important threads. I mean, this story wasn't just, just didn't just happen in 1531, but it was nearly 1,500 years in the making because we've tied threads all the way back to Luke, the gospel writer, and it's a fascinating story. It's, it's one that everybody has got to see and learn. It's very important. It will change their lives as it's changed mine. Okay, I want people to get a little taste. This is the trailer. Take a peek at this trailer for The Blood and the Rose. Look. For those who believe, we have an obligation to know and understand our history. She delivered hope. A message that would change a continent and the world. He gives us the meaning of this struggle and reveals the ultimate triumph of good over evil. This is the battle for our souls. Tim, tell me what you discovered, particularly about the tilma itself. I know a portion of the film deals with that. Right. Well, the amazing science and the amazing discoveries uh, when, when uh, the investigations of the tilma itself unveiled uh, historical, novelty, uh indigenous inscriptions on the garment itself that told a story. Like what? Um, well, there's nine flowers on there. They represent big hills or volcanic mountains. Um, and there's only one four-petal flower on the entire garment. And the, the four-petal flower meant the one true God. 
Okay, yeah. so she was carrying the one true God, but but also that four petal flower is in the, the approximate location of where Tepeyac Hill is amongst the nine flowers, which are the nine volcanic mountains that surround Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So this image is date, time, location stamped, and it identifies who's in the image. It's, it's a very important story that, again, we, we yearn for stories. We should learn to tell our stories and our history. Hmm. Tell me about this, this notion of um, beauty and telling stories well and how perhaps we've lost that. My contention is we lost it. And, and this is why you see the cultural fissures and the violence breaking out and the uncertainty and the family breakdown. So much of that, I think, is related to we, we've lost our ability to gather around these central stories. Christ told right. stories and Absolutely. Shakespeare and everybody else. We've Absolutely. lost that ability, it seems. Yeah, the story, telling stories and repeating stories to other people enabled us to carry on the history into future generations. Mm -hmm. And so the importance of being able to tell a story is, so, you know, now we read it. And, and, and it's not bad to read. I'm not saying yeah. it's not bad to read, but, but you've got to share that knowledge with people. And so, um, you know, finding a vibrant story like Our Lady of Guadalupe, the, the whole miracle which we tell the story in. Tell me about this woman you met in Tepeyac. You were, you were shooting in, yeah. in, in the town where the, yeah. all of these events transpired, and you come across a woman. Great, great Virgin Mary story. Uh, uh, along comes this lady, and she asks me what I'm doing, and, and you know, with excitement and exuberance, I, I tell her I'm doing this great project, and gleefully, and she goes, oh, you Catholics and your worship of Mary. And I went, oh, I said, you're not Catholic. She said, I'm Protestant. And I said, well, let me tell you a story. Uh, every once in a while at uh, our office at, uh, where I work, Renegade, we, we do spirit day and teams, get, everybody gets divided up into teams and they have different colored jerseys and uh, uh, doing do different goofy things all day long. And I'm like Drew Carey in What's My Line, giving them yeah. arbitrary point totals. So uh, along comes the final presentation and the green team is in my office and the phone rings and the receptionist goes, it's your mother. I said, I'm sorry guys, it's my mother. And I pick up the phone and, and, and my mother goes, Timothy. Vote for the green team. Well, the green team had, you know, asked for Conspired. her to call. Yes, they, they got her to call while, while they were in there. So, uh, and, and the lady is looking at me like, what does this have to do with the Virgin Mary? I said, well, my point is simple, that the best way to get to the sun is, is through the mother. We ask for her help. We appreciate her help. We, we don't worship her. We venerate her. I want to show people a little clip. This is about the devotion that was spread as a result of not only the apparition, but then following the evidence of it, the, the, the mark left on the tilma. Take a look. Ten years prior to the Virgin's appearance, the conversion of natives advanced slowly as they clung to their traditions. But quickly, News of the apparition spread, and soon millions of indigenous were converted. In the 10 years following, the conversions were around 9 million. Now, you describe this as a complete telling of the story, the blood and the rose. Um, wh why did it need to be complete? What was missing from the former? I mean, there are a lot of documentaries about Our Lady of Guadalupe. Right. Well, a lot of them were, were factual presentations of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Some were scientific in nature, but we felt that combining the history, the, the, the complete history, as well as the science, and then, then the meaning mm -hmm. uh, was very important. None of them ever told the meaning. Uh, what did this image mean? What does it mean for us today? If it took 1,500 years in the making, it certainly has some sort of profound effect. I mean, like the eyes. No one could have discovered the eyes until far, far later, until we had yeah. the technology. And that's an amazing piece. Tell people about that. You, well, you take it for granted that they yeah, know. They, they, they don't know. know. Right? Well, there's, there's, there's 13 images in each eye, and they're in accordance to the uh, ophthalmological science uh, technology of Perkins G. Sansom, which means you're bigger in this eye, smaller in this mm -hmm. eye. Over here, bigger, smaller, but there are 13 images in both eyes that replicate like that. So they're believed to be the, the witnesses of the unfurling of the tilma, because in it is a man holding a, a, cope, a cape, a tilma, that, that looks like it's about to be unfurled. So it's, it's believed that it's the Virgin Mary's viewpoint as she is coming down hmm. to impress herself upon this tilma. Hmm. Amazing. Uh, what do you want people to take away from this experience? I, I want people to, one, know the complete story because so many people don't know the complete story and it's an amazing story. It will awaken other Catholics that are looking for something to grab onto in their faith, in their faith journey. 
And, and you also have decided not to sell the DVD at this point. What are you right. doing? What's the vision for this? Well, we're doing spiritual events, okay. uh, starting screenings, screenings in essence, but uh, with some speakers who are going to further the teaching and the lessons of what we need to learn at mm -hmm. this point in time. Uh, so we're going to have three speakers, the film, and then uh, at the end of reflection. And hopefully at the end of that, we'll send people out on fire with the Holy Spirit in order to be able to be Juan Diego's, those messenger eagles. And the first, uh, the premiere is at the Warner Theater on the 24th. Who's speaking there? Well, we have Father Leo Paddling Hug, uh, Bishop Gonzalez, mm -hmm. um, and our third speaker is Monsignor Ensler, who uh, just got named Washingtonian of the Year from mm -hmm. Catholic Charities. Uh, and we have some guy, an, an MC, uh, Raymond Arroyo. I don't I, know you him. You don't know him. I don't know him. And I'd rather not know him, I'm sure. <laughs> but I, uh, I, you know, I would urge people to support this. They, I, I think many people, they look at something that's well produced and they go, oh, this is great. It's really expensive to do something like this. I know a lot of your funds are tied up in this. You know, there's an audio Bible we produced a few years ago, this uh, Truth and Life audio Bible. They go, oh, look at these great actors. Well, it costs a lot of money to bring those actors yes, together does. and to do things professionally and well. Yes, and uh, it's, it's an extraordinary film, and we certainly wish you the best of it uh, with it. Uh, for more information on Tim's The Blood and the Rose, or to schedule a screening and spiritual event in your area, visit The Blood and the rose.com. For those of you in Washington, D.C., next week I'll be emceeing the special premiere of the film on the 24th at 7 p.m. Eastern at the Warner Theater. That's the night before the March for Life. It'll benefit Catholic charities of uh, the Archdiocese of Washington. Now, tickets are available at the blood and the rose.com and through Ticketmaster. Tim has graciously given us four sets of tickets to give away to you, our viewers. So email me at Raymond at RaymondArroyo.com. Put the blood and the rose in the subject line. Include your name and telephone number. We'll be choosing winners at random. No unfair things here. And we'll reserve a pair of tickets for you. We'll leave them at will call on the 24th. So email me, Raymond at RaymondArroyo.com. Tim, Thank thanks you. for being on the program. Thank you very much. Well, that is all the time we have. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. The Twitter and Facebook pages are linked on the left-hand side of the site. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo. Uh, next week, we'll have mark the 40th anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision. We'll have an all-star star panel for you following the Mass for Life next Thursday. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next time. Bye now.